Today on Around the Table at Emmitsburg, uh, we're going to be meeting with a group of folks who are here for the multi-hazards planning course for schools. They're at EMI this week, and we're pleased to have them here. You know, in, in recent years, we have found that uh, schools are also vulnerable to a variety of hazards. Uh, student violence certainly comes to mind, but there are other hazards as well. And this week, the folks are working on anticipating a variety of hazards and planning for them. Joining us is uh, Alfred Roberts, who is uh, an executive director with the Dallas Public Schools in Dallas, uh, Texas. He is uh, specifically responsible for crisis abuse and injury prevention. Alfred, welcome. Thank you. Glad to have you here today. Also joining us is Linda Mason, who is the Director of Education and Training for the Arizona Division of Emergency Management in Phoenix, Arizona. Linda, we're glad you're here today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leroy F. Cross, Jr. is also joining us. He is the Commander for Special Operations at the Thornton Police Department in Thornton, Colorado. Leroy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Glad you could be here. And Melanie Granfors is here. Is, uh, it's Melanie Granfors, excuse me, from uh, the Shoreline Fire Department in Shoreline, Washington, not too far from Seattle. That's right. Okay, glad you could be here. And certainly, last but not least, we, we even have a high school principal joining us today. Uh, Mike Narkowitz is the principal at the Bandon High School in Bandon, Oregon. Mike, we're glad you're here today. Thank you. Glad okay. Now, you've been working on school hazards all week, and I think uh, one of the things I'd like to tar start out with here is what kind of hazards do schools need to worry about? I mean, we talk about all kinds of things in the community, but what do schools end up with? Melanie? I would say if you can think of it, it could happen in a school. Um, the range runs from chemical spills to natural disasters that we're all familiar with, earthquakes, tornadoes, uh, hurricanes, volcanic eruptions in our area even, uh, to sniper fire from outside. We've had bank robberies that leaked over into the neighborhood that uh, you know were a threat. Two things such as uh, a tragedy happening to a family within a school that may have a lot of different facets. So, as I say, if it happens in life, it could happen in a public school. These hazards are going to impact the school. Is that safe to say? Absolutely. Oh, yes. Good. Very well. uh, yes. Mike, it's going. It sounds to me like it's probably going to impact the learning process. It not only affects the learning process; it affects the staff as a whole. And, and when the staff's affected, of course, the kids will be affected. And uh, Know, the principal has to be aware that all things can happen and, and, and prepare for that. A variety of hazards. Alfred, I'm sure you've had a, a variety of incidents in your district. Certainly, and I think the key to it is having a crisis team that's well trained and gone through simulated exercises so that when the real thing comes, they are prepared to deal with it in the best way possible. Uh, Leroy? Uh, from a law enforcement point of view, a lot of the things that Melanie mentioned, you're probably going to get to participate in, aren't you? Correct. Uh, it directly affects us, emergency responders, whether it's the police or fire or a combination of both. And uh, uh, it's critical that uh, prior to those things occurring, that we have a good partnership and good understanding with the, the school systems and, and the local government uh, to be, be able to effectively resolve uh, whatever problem we're faced with. So we need to start early. We need a good team. Linda, I think uh, the planning process is critical here, isn't it? It's very, very critical, and, and I'm really pleased to say that uh, many of the states have, have been very aggressive in uh, working with the schools and making sure that programs are available to bring them into the loop to allow them an opportunity to work with the first responder agencies in their area. Because in many situations, the, the schools are the hubs of our communities. And the more that we can prepare and work together and coordinate as a community, the better prepared we're going to be to handle an event or a situation when it arises. So it sounds like we need to start early on this planning process, but uh, we have this, this potpourri of hazards, uh, both external and internal. And I'd and I kind of like to, to talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, Mike, in your community, what, what are some of the hazards that, that you have to look at external to the, to the school, some of the things that, that you might run into? Uh, one of the main things, uh, being from the south coast of Oregon, would be weather, whether it be uh, high winds, uh, high rain, floods, uh, Two main bridges coming into town. Some, you know, one of them, the drawbridge. The drawbridge is stuck. And that could be a hazard. So mm -hmm. you never know. Uh, being rural, having a, a facilities to, uh, you know, it takes an hour for someone to get there. If if we need, a, you know, six hours for a bomb squad, say, mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, our police department, I think, has seven officers, so if we need more police, it's 20, 30 minutes away. So some of the, those are the outside forces that when we're planning for an emergency that we need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Alfred, in, in Dallas, what are some of the, the hazards that you've seen specifically from the outside that might have an impact on, on one of your schools? Well, uh, certain things such as chemical spills. Uh, we have an airport that's located um, right near a school, so the potential for some kind of uh, accident is, is likely there. Uh, other than that, uh, some of the things that have been mentioned previously, uh, violence in the neighborhood spilling over into the school. We do have situations where flooding occurs, so that could be uh, a problem. And then we're in Tornado Alley, so we are very, very vulnerable in terms of weather related to that kind of incident. Now, one of the other things that, that Melanie brought up and I thought was interesting is that there can also be things that happen in the school. And it's, it's not, not just the, the violence kinds of things. There's some other things that could happen as well. What are some of those? Well, uh, we recently had a uh, propane leak in our chemistry lab that affected you know, the south wing of the school. And people you know, start getting nauseated and everything. And you have to prepare for that, what you're going to do in case of a propane leak. Uh, We've had bomb threats, or a bomb threat, mm -hmm. and that affected everything. Mm -hmm. and send the kids home, evacuate. Um, threats of violence, kids having to get this, and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. That you know, affects of not of the learning process, but the whole uh, process of the school. Mm -hmm. and what's happening in the school? So, mm -hmm. Melanie. Well, we had an incident where um, a man who had killed four people in the previous two hours to the final incident killed four mm -hmm. people and then hold himself up in a house near two elementary schools. Uh, it required a lockdown for seven hours of those two schools without very much information as to what was going on. That's probably our most recent. And it actually touched off our involvement, uh, our multi-agency involvement, because at that particular event, some of us did not know each other. The police chief did not know the school superintendent and we realized that that was a bad situation <laughs> and we're working to remedy it mm -hmm. so uh, we learned from a, a very serious crisis that we need that multi-agency approach mm -hmm. when are you going to contribute to that on well um, some of the information that we teach in the multi-hazard program for schools is that to do an, not only an external vulnerability analysis, but an assessment within your school buildings as well. And, and that is where you identify areas that might the school may be vulnerable to, uh, to these events, such as chemistry labs, such as, as what you mentioned, and things of that nature. Uh, look at other, other things as far as school structures located and, and what might um, be involved in, in causing damage not only to the school property, but to the participants in that building, such as when wind damage comes into the area as well. So it's, it's not only what's in the community, but it's what's in the school system as well. And identifying those vulnerabilities early on is a way that you can mitigate against loss of life or damage. It's, it's interesting that uh, it sounds as though we're saying that whatever's in the community is also reflected into the schools. And vice versa. Absolutely. And, and so it, it really doesn't make sense not to have the schools in the emergency planning process mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's one of the vulnerable hazards. Absolutely. Well, in our community, mm -hmm. we are the evacuation point. If anything happens in the city, they come to the schools. And uh, we have to deal with it. We have tsunami warnings, which are mm -hmm. tidal waves. We've never had one, but we, we do go through the drills mm -hmm. and, and yeah. proceed like, you know, as an earthquake in California. Mm -hmm. so. This, this is, I want to I come up off of that, Mike. Uh, let's go to some specific hazards here. What, what do you do for a tsunami? Uh, go to high ground. <laughs> that's, that's a good idea. <laughs> I was good. Uh, for, in our case, since we are the center of um, uh, the evacuation point for our city, there, there are a lot of uh, low-lying areas in our city, the waterfront, mm -hmm. uh, for example, and uh, they were supposed to evacuate at a siren that goes off. And, Head to the nearest evacuation points. We have evacuation maps laid out that are handed out, and, and <clears throat> most of the people in the city are aware. One thing: we are a tourist town, and we have the, mm -hmm. the fire and police officers have to realize that a lot of people don't even know what a tsunami is. So yeah. that uh, information getting that out and uh, 
the students take it pretty serious, but at the same time, they know that you know, the tsunami is not a real threat to them at this point. Mm -hmm. So your school then would be a place where people would come if there were a warning. Exactly. It would be uh, one of the gathering places. Exactly. There are, we have three schools, a high school, a middle school, and a grade school within an hour. It's about a 10-acre campus, and they're pretty close proximity, and, and, and we use the gyms and the cafeterias as, uh, as shelter for mm -hmm. if we would have a tsunami. Correct. Now, in, in the process of working this out, um, you've obviously worked with folks to designate your buildings. Correct. Uh, and then, uh, and this is where anybody else can jump in as well, what are we going to do with the students while this is going on? Well, in our case, since that is the evacuation point, they will remain at the school. We may not be in session, you know, having lessons going on at the time, but they will remain on mm -hmm. the school grounds as instructed. Okay, so they would stay there, they're sheltered, we'd go from there. Now, Alfred, I want to come to you. Tornadoes, uh, they're usually pretty quick. We may not get a lot of warning. So what, what do we specifically need to look at doing? What are the actions that, that folks need to consider if, if they're in that hazard area? Well, fortunately, we've not had one to hit our school district, but uh, the planning is extremely important. For example, our central control uh, security office functions as the alert uh, position or station and the principals have weather radios as well as other supervisors and so hopefully uh, they will have those radios on so that they can hear the signals and then of course they watch uh, the weather channels as well as uh, they're plugged into some of the email situations that give alerts so the key is the warning system and once the warning is given well, if it's a tornado um, uh, watch, then persons know it's a possibility that it might head that way. And if it's a tornado warning, then uh, one knows to go ahead and per perhaps go into shelter. Uh, our schools had a weather drill, uh, all uh, 218 of them approximately a month ago. They had to go through the procedure. And one of the critical things is finding the safe areas within a building. Some of our buildings are aesthetically pleasing, but are very unsafe. So the schools, the crisis teams identify what areas to assemble the kids. And in high school, it's a little more difficult because you don't put them into the kneeling position unless the actual emergency is there. But the key is having the safe areas and knowing what to do in case the tornado is headed your way. How do we define a safe area for a high wind? Uh, event like this? What, what do we need to look at? Well, you try to look at your inner, inner walls, your, uh, your uh, load-bearing walls, I'm told. Mm -hmm. You try to stay away from the open areas such as gyms and cafeterias, mm -hmm. auditoriums, because uh, they are probably going to collapse under the strength of the wind. Uh, we do use our maintenance department, uh, structural engineers, we even use the National Weather Service, as well as our emergency preparedness offices to help us locate those safe areas, because we want to be prepared to save every life that we can in case we have an emergency. A good point. Outside resources to help us identify where the safe areas are. Sounds like a good idea? Absolutely. Yeah. Linda, yes. does that fit in with planning? Because you've been talking about Absolutely. partnerships. This sounds like a possibility. And, and the partnerships from, from the state perspective uh, is that we work with the local units of government uh, at the county level, at the city level, and in the state of Arizona, schools are considered a jurisdiction as well. And, uh, and so we're heavily involved in, in acting as a liaison between many of these agencies, and especially in the school program that we're teaching, uh, the multi-hazard program for schools in the state of Arizona. We, we bring a multitude of agencies into the classroom and integrate that classroom so that we, we start out by encouraging them to work together in the classroom. And, and once they leave that classroom, they go back to their local vicinities and continue that work through the planning process and address areas that they may not have thought of addressing before. If I might add something about, uh, you might wonder, well, what is the connection, the fire department and the school? and it, is, it has so many facets, and we've found that it is, it's absolutely natural. We're in there doing inspections, fire inspections, so we're walking the building with the leaders of the school, looking at, at the building and talking about that thing, that part of the, um, 
the, the, their safety. And then we do mentoring. We have firefighters in the schools doing mentoring. We have fire and life safety programs throughout the uh, curriculum. And we're just, it's sort of a natural part of the community. We're nearby, the kids yeah. come to us, mm -hmm. we go to them. And so yeah. they tend to rely on us. For, and when they find out that we're willing to do more, that mm -hmm. emergency preparedness is part of it, they're surprised and, and quite relieved. Mm -hmm. And to piggyback on what Melanie is saying, I mean, many of them have a vested interest. They have children in mm -hmm. those schools, or they have spouses teaching in those schools. Mm -hmm. So it brings it home. Mm -hmm. It makes it personal. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Leroy, from a police perspective, I imagine you've also got connections other than emergency connections with the schools. Right. In our particular uh, city, we have school resource officers, and those are uniformed officers that um, are assigned to a given school. And their primary focus is not, not making arrests or not what we uh, initially term as basic law enforcement. But they're there to partner with the educators there to inform uh, the kids and, and the uh, staff what policing is all about, why we do what we do. And a follow-on uh, uh, job that those officers have is, is enforcement, so that's secondary. And while they're in the schools, they do things like threat assessments. You know, if we have a, a critical incident occurs, whether it's a severe storm, like in the Denver area, we can have blizzards in the winter. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some things that they can offer to the schools, uh, evacuation points for the kids? Uh, if we have uh, a uh, immediate need to deploy more police officers because we may have, excuse me, <clears throat> an active shooter in the schools. Uh, we're able to uh, get with that school resource officer who's connected with the schools to give us an idea of how to rapidly respond, how can we stop the problem from getting, getting worse. So uh, the police in this regard are critical stakeholders uh, along with fire, school uh, folks, and uh, mm -hmm. other person in the uh, government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Go ahead, Mike. Our SRO officer, uh, this is the second year that he's been in the school, and a lot of us, uh, community and public relations, uh, the police chief and, and our SRO officer have a weightlifting program in the morning before school, and a lot of troubled kids, alternative education kids, go to this oh. weightlifting. And it's given the, uh, a new perspective for the kids, for the police officers. Oh, yeah. uh, our, our SRO officer, we also use him on uh, field trips as a uh, as a supervisor. Mm -hmm. you know, he's dressed in shorts and ready. We took him on a senior trip to Cal, we went down mm -hmm. to San Francisco. And, and the relationship that the kids see with the police officer is totally different than a, a uniformed officer. And, and I think it's been a benefit, a huge benefit for our community as well as the school. Uh, it I sounds might, like a lot of connections going on here. Mm -hmm. I might add to that that, you know, we have seen it that um, the not only the faculty, but the students begin to look at the police officer as, as a friend. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, the only time the police officer comes in contact with yeah. folks is usually during a critical incident. Yes. That's not a happy time. Mm -hmm. So kids come away saying, hey, you know, these people are just like everyone else, they're friendly. Mm -hmm. And when we have an incident, whether it's a, you know, a suicide that maybe affects a member uh, of the school system, police officers there, and they're not there just as that, there's that cop there. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is a friend, someone that can help them, and they feel much better. If the uh, disaster is larger, again, the officer is there as a resource. When other officers are bringing in, people are viewing those police officers as, as helpers that want to help uh, solve their problems as opposed to you know, the old adage, uh, cops here must be a problem. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and our RSR officer yeah. also started an explorer post on our campus where I have to get, we have about 10 students involved with, and it's, it's, uh, it's been a great program. Uh, seniors graduate and certain students mm -hmm. move up and, and it gives the students a buy-in to the safety of our school and what's yeah. going on in our school yeah. and it's an excellent program. Mike, that's an interesting point. Uh, do students have to buy in to safety? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Ahead, in fact, one of, one of our directives has been to try to get things into the curriculum. This isn't something we don't ask students to follow the teacher on a fire drill. We want to teach them that if they were alone in that room, that they would know to look for their exit and go out. And so we're trying to put uh, life safety mm -hmm. lessons into the curriculum and make students aware throughout that this is something used throughout life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also buy in even on things like the lockdown drills or the preparedness. We have students that are learning CERT, com mm -hmm. uh, community uh, emergency response teams, and learning first aid and CPR, bringing them into the process. Okay. So right. it's life skills. Right. And one thing that I've noticed is the seriousness of the students, you know, uh, with, with the high media profile of the, uh, the school shootings. I and mean, when we do our evacuation drills or our fire drills or our lockdown drills, you know, you don't 
don't see the commotion or the screwing around that mm -hmm. we used to in the past. The kids know that we're doing this for their safety, and the student buy-ins there, you know, knock on wood, that it continues that. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I think by educating the kids and letting them, letting them have a say, and, and you know, we're a smaller school and we have more control, but at the same time, the, the students know the threat of violence or, or an evacuation procedure that we're serious, we're not messing around. And, Alfred, are you seeing something similar to that in the, in the larger schools? Yes, and I think this course is very important because I've been in education over 30 years and in none of my courses at the undergraduate or graduate level have I had a class in how to deal with emergencies and the basic elements that we've gotten in the course. I think the course is critically important and should be part of the curriculum. And I need to put in a point that our schools are the safest places, even though our communities, if you will look at the statistics, uh, many of our kids come from very violent situations, but our schools are very safe. So in terms of that, uh, there's a, another important aspect. The curriculum must teach them critical skills of decision making, anger management, uh, trust, and then the adults in a situation also must value the kids because in some situations, some of the youngsters are not valued and that's why they uh, may act out in the way that they do. So in terms of the violence that's created within the schools, we have a tremendous responsibility to try to look for signals that may tell us that uh, violence may occur. So in the larger situations, the students are critically important because they will assume a sense of responsibility and when there is danger in many instances will report that danger and often it's done through an anonymous type of hotline situation. But they have an outlet where they can. Right, they do have an outlet. Melanie, I was just going to say that you can, you can only prepare for a natural disaster, but in cases where the SROs are working and the firefighters, you can, you can prevent some of the, the violence that we're talking about. And it's good for people to know that we are working at that yeah. level as well, not just responding. You know, it, it sounds like mitigation is an important part of that. <laughs> it's, yes, yes, very it much. And uh, we've, we've seen that in our setting where students have enough rapport with the students and that the students can either approach an administrator or a school secretary, whoever they need to, as an outlet, hey, such, I heard such and such. And we take all threats, everything serious. And say, there's an investigation that goes on either by the vice principal, the, uh, myself, or whoever. You know, whoever uh, the school counselor gets involved in, and it's a great process to eliminate, you know, instead of keeping a bottle up inside, it's mm -hmm. not a, you know, we try to eliminate the, uh, I'm not going to rat on my friends type of thing. And we've right. seen that in our setting where it's been a very positive uh, benefit for our staff and students mm -hmm. and the community. Have you seen that in some of your schools? Um. Well, I'm, I, I teach the school systems, mm -hmm. you know, the course and things like that, but uh, as far as getting into uh, discussions with the schools that I've been involved with, um, I totally support and have heard support for the comments. You know, it, it sounds like the, the school resource officer is also an important part as another connection for the students, uh, and I think that's what I'm hearing you say. We, we need to make sure that students are connected with somebody if there's a problem. Is that a, a safe way of saying that? Oh, most definitely. Um, they're connected. Matter of fact, uh, we have seen that on days where the school resource officer may not be in, a in, in his or her school because of some outside training, the kids <coughs> talk about that. Hey, where's the school resource officer? You know, uh, whether it's just want to chit chat or they have a problem at home that they can't deal with, um, they have mm -hmm valued being able to go to the school resource officer to unburden them and, and very uh, um, eloquently the, the school resource officers either get them into some other network to help them come, overcome their problem whatever they don't feel like they're ratted out um, if there's a problem in the school uh, an allegation of a weapon being in the school these people come forth and they seek out the school resource officer where in the past they may not have done that or and they didn't do that and that helps they're getting actively involved in keeping their their school safe. So they're, they're key to um, this whole planning process. Well, I want to actually now move into the planning process. And Linda, you had mentioned that, that early on, we need to do a risk assessment, yes. internal and external. Mm -hmm. So where do we go after we've identified the risks? What's our next step? Okay, then you need to work with uh, 
the maybe the architect of the school to identify areas, the engineers located in their community to review maybe building codes, things of that nature. We have a lot of older schools still in the United States and we have a lot of ultra modern schools mm -hmm. in the United States. And those are issues that at the local level, working with their emergency management director to help coordinate maybe those assets and the local units of government, they can identify people in their community and within state agencies that can help them address those. Okay, so we need to start identifying safe areas. We need to like, look yes. at our buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get folks involved from the outside. We've identified our safe areas. Now what do we do? We need to evaluate and exercise our plans. Um, mm -hmm. I'm reminded of a uh, quote uh, that General Eisenhower said, uh, that plans are nothing, planning is everything and talking about the process. And I, I think we've all probably been there sometime in our career where something has occurred and we've reacted to it and then we go back and say, you, you know, we had plans for these, but we never really exercised those plans. So a key ingredient is the plans that we have in place, are they effective? And maybe they're effective today, but they may not be effective years from now. And are the right people involved in those plans? Uh, do we have too many people, not enough people? So it's very critical. And the exercise of those plans can take a multitude of stages from a roundtable discussion such as this to an actual full-blown uh, scenario and they don't have to happen once a month they can happen you know once a year once every yeah. 18 months something like that but that's critical i want to come back to planning here to the plans uh who's responsible for developing these who, who do you get involved in, in the planning process? Well, Mike? At, at, in our district, it starts at the superintendent, and the superintendent's a very hands-on type of guy, and uh, it's ultimately the school principal's responsibility for the building. At the same time, we have a district-wide plan where pretty much the uh, nucleus of the plan, they're all the same, and, and we just customize it for our building and our staff and, and how many students we have and, mm -hmm. and the bus evacuation drills and, and everything. You know, we try to prepare for everything you can think of, but at the same time, the nucleus of the plan, everything's basically the same, just mm -hmm. altered for different uh, disasters or if you have an intruder or whatever you have, but the nucleus is, is that district-wide plan. Correct. I think you, you look at what is, what is it that we're looking at and we're planning for, and then from that saying, who are those people within the community that are affected by this plan um, and the problem? And it, you really need to make sure that key people in those respective disciplines are involved. Fire department, police department, other uh, areas of local government, uh, uh, key people within the community. Um, and they start formulating and being a part of the process of putting the plan together. If um, we try to put a plan together by ourselves, it may be very effective for us, but not for anyone else. And, in the years that I've been in, in law enforcement, um, I've had many classes I've gone to that were 100% law enforcement, and we dealt with a problem we looked at from a law enforcement standpoint, and never considered, or at least through the class, well, how does it affect other people? The uh, value that I've seen of this class that I'm going through right now is um, I'm seeing concerns and issues that affect uh, my peers outside of law enforcement that I thought, I never considered that. Um, you know, I, I need this thing done. I didn't realize they have all these stumbling blocks, and it makes me look at things a little more broad-based. Uh -huh. An example Melody? for us that, that I think is very um, descriptive was uh, where we had a, a drill, a mock drill, a bus accident, and a uh, fire department responded, and the school di district responded, and we were kind of operating in these separate little pods, and then we realized that during the triage process, and we did have injuries and, and some deaths that were um, staged. But during the triage, triage process, we were sending one, patient one, patient two, patient three, and patient four to the hospital. That's the way we do it. It's, it's very organized, and we know just who we sent where. And the school district was saying, I've got parents that need to know who these kids are. And we went, oh, we never do names. We don't, we don't do names. And then we realized we have to back up and we've got to start doing names. Mm -hmm. So we actually designated a position that will stand right next to the triage officer that will begin to try to identify kids. We're using school counselor. We may even grab a yearbook and try to do that because names is crucial for those mm -hmm. school people. Mm -hmm. and it's not something we ever did. Linda? Yes. Uh, getting back to the planning process. Uh, and. Um, 
a natural in the community to assist the schools in writing plans or your local emergency management coordinator or director. That person is already charged with putting together a community emergency plan and, and should be heavily involved in making sure that contact is made with the schools within the area to, to access the information in the school's plans so that it complements the community plan just as the local community plan should complement and work with the state plan and the state plan complements and works with the federal emergency management plan. So, so we're, we're all in this game together and the more that we learn to work together the better off the whole nation is going to be. How often do we have to look at these plans? Oh, at frequently. Least <laughs> at, at least annually. At least annually, annually yes. uh, if not more often? Well, we review ours annually and before school, have a staff meeting and go over all procedures. And as incidents occur, we, we evaluate what we're doing and is it effective? Do we need this? What do we need to add? Uh, having an SRO officer, having some another uh, idea or a perspective of what's going on is great because usually more times uh, than not, the, the different perspective will help you reevaluate your plan to make sure that you are working together and that things you know, run smoothly in case of emergency. And we're all here for the, the, the kids' safety. We're not you know, involved with who takes credit for what. We're, we're going to make sure our schools are safe mm -hmm. and that if we do have an emergency, to let our community know that we're planned well in advance of what we're going to do. And, and, and we have confidence in ourselves to be able to handle any situation that pops up at our school. Alfred, you, you have a huge school district. Uh, how do you manage this process with all these schools? I think Linda gave a good overview. overview. We've gotten with the persons from the city, and they obviously have linked up with the persons from the state and linked mm -hmm. into federal. The district has a plan that's kind of a template for the schools, but then each school has to develop its own plan and implement its own plan. Each school has a crisis team. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of the planning and implementation, that's very critical because on the team, we have the support staff represented. We obviously have the administration represented. We have the nurse. We have the custodian, a building engineer. Mm -hmm. We have the community person, the community liaison. If there's a security person, we have that person. Uh, we have the cafeteria managers. So everyone that would be affected in, in the upper grades, we will use students as part of the crisis team as well. So each school has a crisis uh, plan and uh, has to test that plan and upgrade it as needed uh, during the school year. I'm glad you brought up testing because we've mentioned drills and exercises, but how should we go about that? I assume that uh, most of the schools have a monthly drill requirement, if nothing else for an evacuation drill, but what else should we do about drills and exercises? Make them realistic. Ah, okay, run with that. Okay, first of all, don't <laughs> I, uh, I would encourage individuals to refer back to your vulnerability analysis and, and what you have identified are your risk. You're going to prioritize those risks and, and deal with it uh, uh, and extract part of the plan that might be applicable to that risk and exercise possibly that portion of the plan. You don't have to bite off the whole chunk and try and swallow it at once. You, you can take parts of your plan and exercise your plan and, and Set goals for your exercises that are reachable goals and not goals that are going to set people up to fail. Um, and those are just some considerations that you need to look at when you're exercising. So we're thinking, thinking we don't start off with uh, the full-blown tornado hit the building, we have hundreds of casualties, y'all come. That's probably not a good place to start. No. Well, right. kind of the piece I was talking about, that <laughs> the basis for your plan, the nucleus, for most of our evacuation drills, and everything we do is the same no matter if it's a tornado, a fire, whatever mm -hmm. we're doing, it's the same. Good and, point. and getting that nucleus so it's uh, well versed and everybody knows what's going on is the key to your evacuation plan <clears> or your <throat> safety plan. If you don't have that in place, then you're in big trouble because you can't predict the weather, you can't predict if an intruder's, and, and you have to be ready for everything. So I think that's a key piece that 
you don't you don't want it to be uh, uh, you know a um, how do you say a, a, a norm in your school that oh we're doing evacuation. You want everybody to realize the importance of what's going on and, and that they take it seriously. Mm -hmm. So so those actually those monthly drills can be the basis for a larger exercise program. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What I was going to suggest is, uh, for instance taking a small chunk would be just the communications portion. That's where our school district found they were the weakest. Mm -hmm. They were calling everybody in the district and so they exercised just simply, didn't even name the event, but there's something that goes on, where do you call, who reports to whom, and they just exercise that communication portion. Mm -hmm. Which is a critical piece, obviously. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Schools have hundreds of students and that means hundreds of parents that want to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And when, and when you involve parents, and that's kind of when the hysteria starts. And that's when mm -hmm. the, that's when you earn your money right then and there. <laughs> uh, it, it's a key piece. We rely on computers, but if you have a disaster, the power could be out. And you need to you know, make sure that you have hard copies of everything that you have on the computer. And sometimes we're lax with that because of you know, the modern era. And I feel that in an emergency, you can't rely on computers. So you're going to have to mm -hmm. be prepared. Leroy, you mentioned uh, just the idea of, of tabletop discussions. Is that a, another good place to, to bring folks together to, to get our plan out on the table and see what happens with it? You bet, and one of the perfect times to do that is we may have a situation happen someplace in the United States that doesn't immediately affect us, and that may coincide with the weekly or monthly staff meeting. And you say, you know, uh, we don't want to take any extra time. Let's take a half hour and say, we had this incident happen in, in X city. Are we prepared today that if this were to occur in our city tomorrow, uh, that we were ready to deal with that? And through a discussion like this, we can say, well, you know, you think I haven't looked at the plan yet, and say, ah, I think we are, or I think we're not. And that discussion there will, will grow. It may take 15 minutes or 30 minutes at the most, and it starts you thinking, it starts that process. And maybe the next staff meeting, you say, let's spend the next staff meeting doing a uh, an analysis of this particular plan so prepared. It's kind of an ongoing event and it keeps people in tune. I like what Linda said. I think it's very critical that if you're going to go into an exercise, make sure you have objectives and people know what you're trying to accomplish and then um, leave them at the end with some level of success. Because if you always find the negative, which is one of the intent of an exercise, so you can work those up, but you leave it with 100% negative, people will feel we're never going to succeed in these things. We're human, so we, we want to feel some successes. Uh, Mike? A piece that I like to do is, uh, after every drill, is to, I have 20 teachers on staff, is to uh, personally thank the teachers for going through the time and taking it seriously. And, you know, every once in a while, I have a teacher forget their role book or something. And don't turn it into a big, huge negative thing, but stress the importance in a positive feedback way that you need to have a great book when you're evacuated. Uh -huh. so, yeah. I think positive feedback to the staff and to the students. We always, if, if mm -hmm. things go very, very well, we thank the students in our daily bulletin and let them know that you know, some positive feedback that, we're, that mm -hmm. this is important to us. So when we're finishing up, we don't just finish the drill or exercise. There's actually another step, isn't there? You don't just oh. walk away from it. Right. That communication is the key. Mm -hmm. And reassessing. Right. You reassess that the, um, was the planning that we had prior to this uh, up to snuff, where do we need to tweak it to make it good again? That's part of that long-term right. strategic planning. We always dust it off and mm -hmm. make sure that it's uh, timely and relevant. Uh, as, if we don't do that as, as best we try, we always seem to miss something and you know, fix it. So we have to plan the exercise. We ought, to, we ought to pick the pieces that we may be vulnerable to or right. we're not sure are going to work. We need to make sure when it's over that we know what worked and what didn't work, and we need to make sure people understand that it did have a positive impact. Mm -hmm. Because part of the, it sounds like part of the positive impact is if we found something that wasn't workable, we can change it. We go back, reevaluate, re reassess, rewrite the plan if necessary, retrain the plan, and then re-exercise okay. the plan. So it's circular. Yeah. It, it is an ongoing process. Ongoing process. I, I think, Mike, that's an important part. What I've been hearing you all say is that. Even though the plan is a document, it's really the process. And Leroy, I think that's kind of what you were saying. I think right. uh, this process is where we come together True. And, right. and build our, our community connections. I want to deal with an issue here that actually formalizes our community connections. And a lot of times, 
at incidents, and Melanie, you brought it up, the school district's over here, and the fire department's over here, and I suspect, suspect there's times when the police department's over here, and uh, we're, not, we're not all working together on this. So, incident command, is this something we need to start looking at? Critical. Go ahead, Lee. Critical. Um, incident command gives us a process <clears throat> that we put the key components together to make sure that we resolve our, uh, our problem. Um, you have a ton of people out there, and if everyone's doing their own little thing, we all have the, the same objective and same goal, but we're all running in different directions trying to accomplish our objective. We're working against each other. Incident Command pulls that together under a unified structure that uh, takes the, uh, assigns various personnel to various responsibility uh, to make it flow and to make it go, basically. So Incident Command is critical, and everybody uh, who's involved shares a piece of that incident command system. Uh, it's not, it may be a fire, and we don't say, well, that's up to the fire department, uh, you know, the police, we're just going to guard the streets and go home. It doesn't work that way. And the school, obviously, has to be involved in this. Absolutely. And in the, in the course, the multi-hazard program for schools uh, course, we have an introduction to the incident command system. But schools already have a system in place and we have just um, uh, offered this information to make them aware that the first responder agencies also have a system in place. And when we can unify this system so that everyone is reading from the same sheet of music, then an event uh, will be maybe handled much more cooperatively if the, the structure is used. Melanie, in your instance, uh, you mentioned the triage, and, and we're kind of doing separate things. Incident command sounds like that might help resolve that. It, it would resolve it fully. The other thing is, is that people do what they think is right, when, for lack of information otherwise. And so everyone has good intentions, but this kind of formalizes those good intentions <laughs> with one specific area. And also, people are overwhelmed by too much to do, and that's another beauty of the system, is that it gives you a small area, you own that, and you don't have to worry about the, being overwhelmed. Um, for us, it, it is the way to go, and it puts us on the same page, as you yes. say. We're speaking the same language. There's another little area that it helps work on, and that is turf. You yes. know, you've got a um, school superintendent and a fire chief and a police chief, and, and um, that's a realistic human thing. We're looking at turf. And this is a way to put those positions together in a, in a unified command, as, as it's called, and to kind of work through some of those uh, jurisdictional problems. So we get to bring the decision makers together in incident command to make sure we're making good decisions together. Yes. Right. Doesn't yes. mean anybody's giving up their turf. No, nope. correct. It means we're coordinating our turf from the yes. sounds of it. Doing exactly. what they do bring best. Our and in a large school system, it may operate uh, in a different way. Uh, the principal is in charge of the incident command center, mm -hmm. and the principal, by nature of his responsibilities, uh, her responsibilities, has to coordinate where the kids are and whether they're safe and whether uh, the media is being taken care of. But it's important that the principal be in the command center mm -hmm. or have a representative to carry on the communications. And a large system, uh, the principal would work with his supervisors. Mm -hmm and may request the activation of the Emergency Operations Center, which is a major operation with all of the key people, mm -hmm. maintenance, maintenance facilities, communications at mm -hmm. the central office level, yeah. so that all those key persons are in touch with the mm -hmm. incident. So the communications is very important, and the principal, and I talked with some of the persons from fire and from the police departments, they're not interested in coming in and taking over the responsibilities of the principal. Mm -hmm. But it's critical that they coordinate with the principal uh, in the operations that are going on. Yes. Alfred, it, it seems to me, although I'd, I'd like to think it's obvious, that even if there is some sort of critical incident going on at a school, the school district is still responsible for the children. That's correct. Uh, so we, we can't leave them out of the loop because they have to fulfill their responsibilities. For example, what happens to the lunch periods, mm -hmm. uh, the bus schedules, all of that still has to go on. It has to continue. As we, as we wrap this up, uh, I'm going to throw you a little curveball here. We'll, just, we'll go around the table here. <laughs> if you were speaking to other professionals in your arena, what would be 
the one message that you think they absolutely positively have to get from your experiences, both in the street and, and here in the class, what's that one message that if you were going to look them in the eye and tell them that you would want your colleagues to hear from you? Now, there's lots of messages, but if you had to pick one, what would it need to be? And Alfred, I'm, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> we okay. we got to start somewhere. What's that one message for your okay, colleagues? Throughout the nation, as we are quite aware, student achievement has perhaps uh, been the focus. Uh, principals have extreme accountability. In fact, I was reading yesterday about the principals in Maryland. Some of them are being retired involuntarily because their test scores didn't go up or whatever. So it seems to be the key focus is student achievement. I'm not saying that it should not be. But uh, I would say to principals and others that student achievement is critically important. But also, the other part uh, of a student's life is also important, the um, social development, I'll call it. A kid needs to know how to get along with other persons, needs to know how to protect himself or herself during an emergency. And this extends into the homes when the emergency is on the street in the home. So I think if they're taught well how to deal with emergencies in school, this will carry over to the home. So I guess the simple message would be student achievement should not be the only focus because if our kids are not safe and if they're not alive, then we can't deal with student achievement. Good point. Thank you. Linda, from an emergency management perspective? Well, I definitely have told my <laughs> colleagues uh, throughout the United States that it is really uh, critical that we look at the schools as another customer and that we not only need to make our courses available, not just the school course, but there's a lot of supporting courses such as emergency planning courses, uh, the incident command course, other courses that we offer to the local first response agencies and other government officials that are quite applicable for the school systems as well. And if we're going to integrate the classroom to include all of these agencies and school systems in the classroom, we need to make sure to put our schools on our mailing lists when we announce our courses. Great, so, good point. Yeah. Leroy. For those communities that aren't doing it, it's a critically important, in my opinion, that the uh, senior executive officers of the agencies, the police chiefs, the fire chief, the school district, uh, uh, personnel or, or school district uh, representative, superintendent, need to meet at least annually to discuss issues that affect the school and how that uh, uh, contacts and, and, and impacts the other agencies, police, fire and such, and how it affects our community. They need to meet to know each other face to face to get that particular rapport. Once that occurs, they will send the orders down to the people who will do the work and they'll carry the task. But if those folks who are the, uh, the ultimate decision makers don't meet, then a lot of the work that may be done below may not have the credibility, may not get to where it's supposed to go. So I think it's vitally important that the ultimate bosses get together every so often. We realize they're extremely busy to talk about issues that are affecting the schools and how they affect the community and everything. Good point. Melanie. I'm sorry, I have to echo it. It's, <laughs> it's, we have SWAT teams and high-tech communications and high-tech firefighting techniques and preparedness. It, it still comes down to interpersonal relations. And unless you are face-to-face -face with people that you're going to be in a crisis with and understand each other's language and That's how right. to share information, you, you can have all the tools in the world okay. and it won't be successful. It'll work. Mike, we started with an educator. We're going to end with an educator. Well, my number one message would be to not be naive enough to think that it won't happen in your school because it will yeah. and, and it could be sooner than later. And to <clears throat> always, I know it takes a lot of time to go through your emergency plan and to educate all your teachers and your staff, but it'll be worth it in the end. If you can save one life or, or keep a kid out of harm's way, that it's worth it. And we're all we're all in the test scores and we're all in achievement. And, and that's... You know, that's what makes the newspapers, and but the safety plan is absolutely critical and to communicate with your staff and, and the fire department, police department, and just to make sure that you're prepared that when it does happen to you, because it will, that we're ready to go. All right, good point. Well, as we've seen, school safety is not simply a matter of the school working, it's the community working together. And I want to thank all of our, our participants for being here, and thank you for joining us on Around the Table at Emmitsburg.